Everyone, thank you for, um, for joining or joining again after the break. Um, I appreciate that. So I'm going to bring us back to prehistory to begin with. Um, and uh, for those of you who are here for Liv's paper, um, kind of be on similar topics, sort of championing the, the significance of the mundane um, and also touches upon some of the, the aspects that Rachel was talking about, um, the use of exotics to make status um, uh, statements and to make it visible. Um, and it's also going to be semi-exploratory, it's sort of a spin-off of my PhD project. Um, so my project, I'm at the end of my second year, um, I'm looking at consumption practices in the late Iron Age um, in Southeast Britain. So from about 400 BC to the Roman invasion in 43 AD, um, and in the Southeast specifically, so um, Southern Cambridgeshire, Kent, East Sussex, uh, Essex, some Greater London, Hertfordshire. Um, and this region I selected mainly because of the comparably large body of um, excavation material and evidence due in part to the um, recent uh, commercial work in the area. Um, and also because it's the region's proximity to the continent means that the practices, notions of identity and material culture are sensitive to, ex sensitive to exposure to and interaction with the continent. Um, <clears throat> so other scholars have already noted the, the dearth of discussion regarding consumption in this um, in the British Iron Age, especially the practices around it, um, beyond just the food that was being eaten. So this discussions that do tend to, that do exist tend to be limited to uh, what was eaten, a subsistence-based focus with an emphasis on agriculture and production, um, or alternatively, their concerns with high status, regular, and special feasting activities. So these latter studies tend to rely upon highly visible exotic and luxury items, um, which I'll be presenting as well, um, related to consumption um, for their evidential support. Um, so there's currently very limited discussion of, sort of what falls in between this really subsistence space and very high status stuff, more of what's happening on, the daily, on a daily basis, um, how is food being um, actually prepared and experienced by the everyday person. Um, so th through the course of this presentation, I'll discuss um, several dimensions of power associated with these exotic and luxury artifacts and hopefully demonstrate the need to integrate these with the sustenance of more common, if mundane, um, counterpart assemblages. So in terms of my aims, the first two aims that I presented here actually led to the second two. Um, so to revisit and reassess the categories of material culture of traditional focus in the, the feasting literature of the late Iron Age in Southeast England and to explore the origins of nature's, nature of power of feasting related artifacts, um, which again then led me to these last two, which was um, to explore some of the pitfalls of focusing on the unusual um, <coughs> and to revisit the narratives of feasting in the British Iron Age and the appropriateness of the current feasting theoretical frameworks to this period. Um, in terms of structure, I'll start with a brief introduction into the theories of feasting and the associated material culture of the late Iron Age in this, in this region, uh, and then discuss the more problematic aspects of current frameworks and understandings of feastings during, feasting during the period, um, and some insights into the equally problematic origins um, of these frameworks. And then lastly, I'll discuss how these origins have resulted in the construction and perpetuation of implicit hierarchies of value, and how these have hindered us in the past. Um, and hopefully explore some new possible directions for research. Um, so feasts are interesting and relevant to discussions of power and politics because they're arenas of power. They provide their organizers and attendees the opportunity to create, manipulate, <coughs> and demonstrate relationships and dynamics of power through concepts of exchange and hospitality. Uh, though definitions of feasting vary from one context to another, they almost all have three elements in common. Um, so firstly, they involve commensality, which is say communal consumption involving at least two people. Um, and secondly, feasts contrast with daily consumption in some way. They mark events that are different to regular meals and they involve food or drink that are special, typically in quantity or quality. In terms of material culture of feasting, um, so they feastings made visible by, again, this difference from from normal meals, um, usually with the food and drink we have, or the, or the utensils, or the um, vessels that we used to serve with. So where feasting dishes involve the same ingredients as daily meals, they may differ in their quantities or, or means of ingredient combination, preparation or serving. Um, and alternatively, feasting fare may involve foods that differ in quality. So they're maybe more rare, more exotic, or, or somehow um, 
more difficult to procure than normal ingredients. <clears throat> so this is maybe the first dimension of power we might consider of, of these um, food and drink items related to feasting. Um, they play a host of roles in their Iron Age feasting context. They their presence marks the feast from ordinary consumption, again, in either quantity or quality. Uh, they provide legitimacy to the feast organizer. Uh, they make power and influence more visible or tangible, um, generate social distinctions and allow for commensality, again, food sharing, uh, solidifying the relationships between eaters by formalizing debt or exchange um, or kinship ties, uh, for example. Um, so. The, the, this first dimension of power, the food and feasting related artifacts are central to definitions and practice of feasting. You can't have feasts without the food or the drink. Um, they embody the dynamics of exchange and political relationships and provide a physical medium through which these relationships are negotiated. As such, you might consider to the, have them, for them to have power in their own right uh, in their original Iron Age context. Um, so some of the evidence that we and to focus on uh, in this in this context uh, for feasting activity. Um, this is from uh, Dietler and Hayden's Feasts book, which is one of the major bodies of work in this field. Um, and here Hayden has presented some potential categories that we might look for in the archaeological record. Um, and I just have some brief images that so these are fire dogs to pop up to uh, build a fire on. Um, Amphora. Got in this bucket. These are handles of, of tankards. Um, this is a taza, imported cup. So, of course, animal bones, large assemblages of um, animal bones being consumed. The indigenous pottery, um, a bit bland. Uh, we've got cauldrons. Um, and then historical sources are pretty, um, pretty limited. I, I'm not aware of any that refer directly to Britain um, in terms of the feasting. Um, and in terms of imported plants, I'm only aware of one instance, and it's a single uh, fig seed from a trading center at Hennesbury Head um, in this region that might speak to imported foods. Um, so there are some problems when it comes to um, our, identif our identification of feasting um, and understanding its social significance in the later Iron Age in this uh, area. So first of all, archaeologists are working with non-explicit definitions. Um, they're not in agreement over what constitutes a late Iron Age feasting assemblage in this region. Can we identify them by large numbers of animal bones, by the presence of amphora shards, by large ratios of quartz wares, or conversely imported vessels? Can we extrapolate from the feasting-related grave goods of the limited richer burials to build up a picture <coughs> of regular practice? Um, so these are all um, different approaches that researchers have taken. Um, but essentially no one agrees on how to move forward. Um, so the collections of material culture found in the few richer berries of the period are often cited as evidence of an increased focus on the themes of feasting in the hearth. Other researchers have looked for the deposition of near complete vessels like um, Martin Pitts, um, a predominance of coarse wares over fine wares, uh, Sarah Ralph, um, after some work on European Fjörek Shansen, and large assemblages of animal bones uh, also Sarah Ralph. Um, but perhaps conversely, there's also an accepted narrative of a shift from communal to individual use of food during the period, with the disappearance of hill forts during the later Iron Age and an influx of elite items being interpreted as a change of emphasis from large feasts to the use of luxury foods and items paid for in grain to express exclusivity, elitism, and distance. Um, that's after Van Der Veen. So ultimately, this is all resulting in a confused narrative of the socio-political use of food over the Iron Age. There's a discussion of the increased use of political feasting events during this period, but then there's also an acknowledgement that there's a shift from communal dining um, to an individual use of food. So there seems like some sort of contradiction there. Um, and the way I read it, um, to a great extent, this confusion um, stems from another lack of definition of sorts, which is what constitutes uh, normal consumption. Um, I think we're, we're lacking a baseline of the daily regular consumption practices and what this looks like in the record um, against which we might be able to measure unusual activity. Um, it's, it's difficult to approach what constitutes unusual activity um, when we haven't actually uh, identified what normal patterns look like. So this led to um, curiosity on my part um, about whether such a focus on the high status 
luxury, exotic materials um, was really warranted and whether what we're seeing is a case of maybe the evidence being fit into the theory. I think it's probably significant that um, a lot of the major works on feasting, particularly for this period, um, have come out after the 2001 publication of the Feasts book. Um, and there's also a precedence of imports being overprivileged in Iron Age scholarship. So uh, something I cited in my abstract was um, the limited, relatively limited number of emperor shirts that were found in this region were initially suggested to imply the central role of imported wine and other prestige goods in the maintenance of or accumulation of power at critical events and rites of passage. But more recently, um, comparisons with assemblages from Northwestern Europe have led us to believe that actually the role of uh, wine in political context was probably overstated. Uh, quantities reaching Britain were probably insufficient to regularly support feasting organizers and leaders, and maybe it was it's more likely they were drinking beer. Can't blame them. Um, so again, we have this, this tendency to focus on the unusual in archaeology to begin with. Um, we've got some indigenous British pots um, on the left, and then on the right we have um, a burial assemblage including some amphora um, and wheeled term pots. Um, objectively speaking, I think probably they're, they're more visually appealing, the ones on the right, so it's, it's understandable. Um, so the tendency to focus on the unusual also manifests itself um, on an overemphasis on imported materials and indicators of foreign cultural influence at the expense of the indigenous. This is evident in a number of site reports, um, published site reports, which often peripheralize the Iron Age material at the expense, well, they peripheralize the Iron Age ceramic material in favor of the Roman material, often because it's Romanists who are looking at, um, at the Iron Age uh, historic material um, and the, the predilection for foreign materials and culture and the according roles afforded and the high cultural value placed upon these objects is probably most evident in some of the earliest Iron Age scholarship of this country. So I've, I've highlighted some, some words here that um, Evans, um, Sir Arthur Evans has used to describe pottery in an 1890 work on the Aylesford uh, Cemetery in Kent. Um, so in contrast, these are a lot of Belgic style vessels, um, <clears throat> some of the first wheel turn items produced in Britain uh, and also made in the continental tradition. Um, they're admired. Um, for their physical beauty and their European slash classical pedigree. Um, and the origins of this apparent bias towards classical culture is probably quite deeply rooted um, in the field of archaeology and the socioeconomic backgrounds of some of the earlier uh, gentlemen scholars like Evans. Um, and also the framing of classical historic <coughs> sources and also later scholarship that presented Celtic and Britain, uh, British, Celtic and Roman culture with a within a dichotomous framework um, of barbarianism <coughs> and, and civilization. So where the indigenous or Celtic objects are given real consideration, they're, obvious, they're quite often viewed primarily as art objects. Um, but more recent studies have attempted to, to resituate them in their original contexts as, context as intimate parts of life. Um, so this brings us to the second dimension of power. Um, which is the ability to stimulate and our imagination as archaeologists and enchant us in the same way that they likely enchanted um, past people to the effect that we often that we tend to go to great lengths to assign them critical roles within history. Um, and again, going back to Evans, um, just wanted to pick out some, some interesting phrases. Um, so well-marked type, essentially different from the rude traditional pottery. Um, Betray an altogether different pedigree and the influence of more classical prototypes, still more interesting from the comparisons to which it inevitably, inevitably leads us, i.e. Uh, classical origins. So I want to be clear, I think the presence, the presence of imported and exotic materials is and was significant, um, but significance doesn't necessarily equate usage or extents of the role played by these materials, and it doesn't necessarily aid in our hunt for identifying um, the practices enacted by humans, um, even if the practices were supported by these use of objects. So in other words, a human without things can perform practice, but objects without humans cannot. And that brings us to a third potential <coughs> dimension of power, um, 
So here's a quote from um, Elizabeth Hamilton. She's actually referring to the North, Northwestern context, the Northwestern European context, but it may as well be written about the Iron Age. She writes, archeologists hardly need reminding that the mere popularity of luxury objects from another culture does not necessarily mean much in the way of culture change. When does the sheer weight of artifactual preferences imply a greater or lesser degree of culture change? Assuming that one is defining culture as a set of ideas and not merely as a collection of artifacts, when does the prestige of a thing transmute into an active preference for the culture behind it? Um, so the third dimension, the power granted to these artifacts by archaeologists, who in turn impose hierarchies um, of value and cultural structures upon the material. So going, and here's a sort of rough diagram I've, I've put together Thank you. last minute. Um, kind of explaining how I, I see the organization, our cultural sort of hierarchies that we've placed upon the material. We've got imports, exotics at the top, uh, the Br British luxury items and unusual artifacts uh, like tankers, um, sort of in line with those produced in continental styles and then at the very bottom probably um, maybe boring indigenous material. Um, so where do we go from here? So I think firstly we've got to establish a baseline of what normal consumption looks like archaeologically, um, which is Sort of the base of my, my dissertation work, something I hope to address. We need to look at the picture of eating and drinking as a whole, uh, and then establish what the anomalies are, and we should look to the sort of more interesting classes of artifacts to assist with this. We can and we should use various exceptional classes, like the ones presented here, um, to do so, but they should be assessed in the context of use rather than simply as exceptional items of art or prestige, um, and they should be integrated with indigenous artifacts. Um, in a bit to remove, to a reasonable extent, uh, some of the implicit biases that we've, we've built our work on, um, we might use um, or consider further um, explorations into the quantitative analyses. So Martin Pitts has had, um, I think, a lot of success in his, in his work on Iron Age and Roman ceramics of this region, uh, using correspondence analysis to resituate data, provide meaningful insights into artifacts um, and their associated depositional contexts. Um, and to limit tendencies to fit the material into theory. Um, and another approach maybe is to rethink the categories by which we analyze artifacts rather than um, separating them into exotic, imported, and local. I mean, I know to an extent this is because of the, the specialties of those who are um, analyzing them, but I don't know that this necessarily reflects the way that Iron Agers were thinking about their possessions. Um, were they thinking about them as this is local and this was made abroad? Or were they thinking about them as this was more expensive or this took more time to create? So I think maybe breaking those down might be useful. Um, and finally, I think we may also want to consider that the material culture presented here, and especially the unusual types uh, found in the high status graves, are indicators of just that, maybe high status dining um, or consumption rather than necessarily feasting. It's not to say that feasting wasn't occurring, but I think we need to shift our lens and we may not be at a stage where we're ready to actually identify it yet. Thank you.